It's time for Game On Hockey with Travis Dunn and Scott Taylor. Near side, Reese Gaver shoots, scores! Talking all things from the blue line to the red line. A breakaway for Kaprizov. He's in. He shoots, he scores! And beyond. Sure, old-time hockey. Like it is sure. Yeah. yeah. Now here are your hosts, Travis Dunn and Scott Taylor. We open up the gate and we let in uh, the head coach of Lindenwood. The latest edition, well, there's one more come on board since you, actually, but Rick Zombo, head coach. Hey, Rick, how are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing, fa- I'm doing fantastic. Thanks, Travis. Well, you were in, that, uh, com- in the room listening to that uh, conversation with the Pilot Mount Hockey Academy. Uh, pretty exciting times in the growth of this game, isn't it? Travis, they have a bunch of those here in St. Louis. I was ahead of the curve. I had an off-ice training facility. Uh, ownership were three Blues players at that time. And it was amazing how good it was. It was a tough sell. We didn't have ice. It was synthetic ice. It was a tough sell. But you don't have to chase somebody on skate 200 feet to get the correction that's necessary. And the amount of reps and everything, it was fantastic. And we probably ran all these kids through supplemental training. And our business got too big um, for our facility. And we started looking. Uh, as a matter of fact, we went as far as white boxing and, and old deserted grocery store uh now it's going to be an ice rink in addition to our supplemental training then the three on three comes out which is a big craze now you know the small studio rinks and we're way ahead of that curve but what happens like anything when you pick up and move stuff into storage not only does it get outdated but it gets forgotten and then as a matter of go find something else and and uh instead of trying to beat the trends of hockey school gee it's not real ice and synthetic's not good for your skates it's like you know what i'll I'll just go to the ice and do the same thing so you're making a gigantic step quickly there's a number of schools that have have set it off a year a year and a half down the line before they they make that first they play that first game of ncaa division one hockey you're coming right out of the acha season and you're going right to division one are you ready to go as a coach, even if we had 15 years of tenure at the division one, you're never ready. Right? It's, it's like you're always unsettled. It's like what you see here is a duck above the water, but inside it's just churning and it's nonstop work. What people don't realize is so our, our women's program, I think it's seven years they've been division one. And at that time, Linda Wood was put on a mandatory three-year hiatus imposed by the NCAA to make sure that you get everything in line. So at that point, what I was in control was building the hockey program. So as far as my assistant coach and myself, we built the guts of a hockey program in here. Uh, I'm a firm believer. I don't care what sport you're involved with. At the university level, it's all about recruiting. So building databases, creating uh, relationships, networking. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, this year we're building the 04 database uh, for recruiting. Uh, so it's a pretty substantial database. I mean, you call it a Christmas list, uh, eventually recruiting a sales, right? Unless you get a commitment, uh, that's the most important thing. So um, the program had been in, moving in the right direction. It was just a matter of getting a rubber stamp. And, and finally, our, our president gave the rubber stamp. It was, matter, it was the opening day of our national tournament. It could have been worse. You know, I asked him to prolong it at least four or five days. Um, but he was on vacation. And uh, good leaders have a lot of patience and even on the outside observing, making certain that he had the right pieces in place, making certain that the numbers went. And uh, it, it was one hell of a day. I mean, I don't think my players felt the skates underneath them, um, but he not only addressed me and my assistant coach in the morning, but also our team had a pregame meal at the rink. Uh, and it, it, it's been fantastic. And then we're off and running. The, the first thing was getting a schedule. So our tournament opened on Thursday and Friday we're on the phone uh, rekindling the relationships that we had built in August before our season started to put a schedule together. And uh, it's, it's been ever since. I mean, our schedule is, it's a strong one. You know, we targeted 20 games. We felt that 20 games would be um, not too lofty. Uh, we're at 25 now. Uh, and, and then this week is just uh, now we get on the phone as far as recruiting. So uh, the players come after the schedule and now it's a matter of uh, putting a team together. That's the voice of Rick Zombo. 
head hockey coach of the Lindenwood Lions men's hockey team, Lindenwood University, University Lions, uh, now the latest addition to Division One hockey. And, of course, the familiar voice, uh, former University of North Dakota player. We do this show on Zoom. And one thing he did pull up behind him is a 1982 National Championship banner that he participated in at UND. Uh, that's kind of a nice thing to have in your office. Is that, does that uh, start a lot of conversations? Uh, it's behind my desk. It's, it's, it's not the right thing to have in a Lindenwood University coach's <laughs> office, but a friend of mine had it framed for me. And it's been here for a couple months. I just have to get it home. But this turned out, I mean, I've done a lot of interviews with Grand Forks Media and you, Travis, and it's might as well keep it here for one more day. <laughs> I'm proud of it. As you Are you ever going to get used to saying fighting Hawks? Never. Never. The best uniforms in the world was the fighting Sioux uniforms, like the best. And everybody knows, you know, and one of the greatest things about the alumni for UND is they travel all over. Like when we hosted the Frozen Four here in St. Louis, it was unbelievable the amount of fighting Sioux fans that, that came down for it. And I don't care where it's at. Uh, it, it's a strong contingent of loyal supporters. And you talk about that with with your program, uh, the fan base. What kind of a fan base has been developed, and what do you anticipate moving forward as far as, far as that? Does winning bring it, or is it just the fact you have a team right now no. going to bring that? I no, mean, I don't care where you are, Travis. It's about winning. you got to win. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's true. all about winning. <laughs> yes, you is. know, the one thing about hockey is it has to be a party. It has to be exciting. The game is secondary. We have an unbelievable facility that's only two years old that we call home. Uh, we have the digs, yeah, coaching, it's called recruitable. We have a facility that's recruitable. Uh, now it's a matter of getting the word out. And, and what's nice for us, we can not only be the big dog on campus at Lindenwood, but also in the city of St. Louis and the surrounding areas, because our only competition for that expendable income is, is the blues hockey. So, I mean, we have, uh, 2,500 individual seats in our arena and, um, uh, other than that, it's an hour and a half drive to University of Missouri, and the football season ends in February, then basketball picks up. So uh, we have a great opportunity here, uh, and we have St. Louis uh, Sports Commission behind us and the St. Louis Blues. As a matter of fact, we share the same rink uh, practice facility as the St. Louis Blues. So uh, it's just a matter of getting the word out. And uh, Starting 22-23, we're going to be on the road for almost all of our games. So it gives us a little bit of time to create that. Lindenwood has had a big name among female hockey players in Manitoba. There have been a number of female players who have gone to Lindenwood. Um, tell us about the campus. What's the place like? Um, you've been there for a while now. Um, uh, just, uh, just introduce us to Lindenwood. Scott, I've been here for 14 years. Uh, St. Louis is a small, big city. Uh, it's fairly what I consider clandestine, where uh, it's hospitable, very welcoming. Lindenwood University is about 20 miles just west of downtown St. Louis. So I don't care if you're north, south, uh, west, east, south, other than maybe a couple hours in the morning and a couple of in the evening, there's no such thing as rush hour. So everything's 20 minutes away, half hour away. 4,500 students enrollment. Uh, it's, it's an extremely uh, wealthy school, uh, wealthy in the part that it's almost like a farmer. They own an awful lot of property in uh, St. Charles County. And uh, the five-year plan is to extend our campus life to, to St. Charles County. So it's an extension of athletics um, out through uh, St. Charles and city proper. So it's, it's, uh, it's been built on sports teams. I think there's 70-some sports teams uh, at Lindenwood. And not only is our men's hockey program going to Division One, but 17 other Division two sports and are making a jump. So it's been a huge transition in the last two months for athletics at Lindenwood University. And uh, there's a lot of moving parts when it comes to uh, managing all of that. You talk about learning to manage all that. Would you take, take yourself back to that first day in the campus of the University of North Dakota? You go to the rink and Gino Gasparini's sitting there and looking at you and growling at you as a freshman. Uh, explain what you were then to where you are now as far as knowledge of the game and, and what coaches have it influenced you to be the coach you are today? Well, Thanks. And thank goodness I'm not a smoker. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you used to torch a lot. Yeah. Uh, it, it was very interesting. So uh, building relationships was, was something that was really special to me. Uh, I was fortunate to have my choice of, of many schools. 
Um, as it is now, even back then, it's got a reputation, a well-deserved reputation of producing pros. And I think the first time that I came in, he was on the phone with a general manager for some NHL teams. Uh, that was consistent. Um, just like Gino was like a father. Um, when you're at the rink, you know, he left you alone, really didn't care anything. Uh, but he surrounded himself with good assistant coaches. And uh, you had the tradition that always got passed down, not only by alumni that had played there, but the upper class. Then you knew exactly what direction you were walking and how to get the job done. So um, I went there my freshman year. I think I know all six of us played in the NHL. So it was a hell of a recruiting year. Um, this, uh, you know, everything about it, it, it was perfect for me. Like, 13 hours uh, drive away from Chicago is like the other, ever end of, end of the world. And then to learn about block <laughs> heaters and, and uh, glass liners on your vehicles, that was new to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ground blizzards were new to me. I mean, everything was new. I, I wasn't immature when it came to winter and snow, but I went to North Dakota to play hockey. Right. And I knew exactly why I was going there, and it's the best move I ever made. I got a question for you, and, and Scott, I'll, I'll, throw, I'll let you throw the next question out there. There have been uh, – Jonathan Taves, obviously, has just played his 1,000th one game in the National Hockey League. So this is a test part of it. And, and, and Scott can jump in this, too, if you want, if you wish. The other players, there have been uh, – UND leads with six uh, players in the National Hockey League, college-wise, who have – played 1,000 games. I gave you James Patrick. I probably mean, I changed. I just threw, I just threw an answer. Jonathan Taves is the one, obviously, can you name any of the others? And I just threw one at you. You played with them. So go ahead and start naming. Uh, that's me. Ludwig's got to be one. Yeah. Ludwig's one. Yep. Yeah. Taves, Ludwig's Patrick's one. Yep. Uh, Troy Murray's got to be right there. No, he's, he did not. Do no. That. No. No. no? Uh, what about Tipper? Dave Tippett? Uh, no, nope. Not Dave Tippett. Um, I played with these guys, huh? Yeah, well, there's not all of them. I mean, there's some of them from later years. And Scott, you probably Zach Parise. Well, Eddie, Eddie Balfour has got to be close. He's close. Yes. He did not. Zach Parise at 1125. Yeah. Travis Zajac at 1037, and David Christian yeah. at 1009. You were pretty yeah. close yourself. You got to 652 with a number of game, yeah. number of teams around the National Hockey League. Um, and so, talk about that experience. So, Scott and I had Keith Gave on the Russian Five author. Uh, yep. You had some pretty personal experience in your chi- in your time in Detroit with that group, yeah. correct? Uh, I, I was actually gone by the Russian Five. So uh, when Konstantinov okay. got in, uh, I was assistant captain. I got traded in October to St. Louis. Uh, the, the year before that, Nicholas Lindstrom came in. Um, right then is when there was an influx of Europeans uh, coming in. So Sergei Fedorov was there two or three years prior to me. Peter Klima, uh, four years prior to me. So uh, that when, when I was there, Detroit, so I played 12 games my first two years up. Uh, those were the years where 50, 55 points. I mean, it was almost a shoe in where uh, opponents were going to beat us. Uh, then, then after that, Jock Demers come in as a coach. That's where I got my first chance, first legit chance uh, making a lineup. I, I got cut from uh, tryouts. I know. Uh, they have plane tickets before tryouts even started. Um, but I had a real straightforward conversation with him, and he was a man of his word. So you asked me earlier as far as coaches that mold uh, me as a coach. Uh, I take bits and pieces of, of everybody. Jacques Demers would be one as far as trust and loyalty. Um, but, but what they did in Detroit was they sent guys down to the minors. You got to earn your craft. They had veterans down there already finishing their pro tenure uh, that uh, has to, had established themselves in the NHL. And, and it really built a real strong nucleus uh, for what was coming down the road. Uh, I think we surprised teams uh, when we lost uh, in the semifinals to Edmonton, the Hall of Fame, Stanley Cup winning Edmonton Oilers. Uh, same thing the following year, we lost to Edmonton. Um, but the Europeans started uh, coming in after Peter, Kl- Peter Klima. And I think Andy Murray was the coach at that time that really made the influx. Um, I got a call. Well, the, the, the year that I got bought out of Boston, Scotty Bowman uh, called me. I thought I was getting pranked. You know, it, it happens frequently with hockey players. Uh, but Scotty actually called me to come back. And uh, at that time, it was a two-way contract, and I was fairly uh, established that, that I was an NHL player. Uh, but that, that was another year they could have won, which I regret. 
And one thing I have not reached. Um, and it's nice to have aspirations. For me, just to play one game was an accomplishment. And I, I, I enjoyed myself in practice. As long as I was in a lineup, I was happy and I had to earn every day. But uh, that Stanley Cup had eluded me, but I've gotten everything since. You all, you now have your team into the NCAA Division I category. Yes. You have NHL experience. You are a national champion in the NCAA. What qualities does it take? What players are you looking for? And how quickly do you think you can build a winner there? If I told you what our schedule is, wins are going to come very difficult. Uh, we got three of the top four teams that are in the tournament right now uh, on our schedule for 22-23. Uh, North Dakota is one of them also. <clears throat> I got to be true to myself and know what I like to coach. So my history of coaching goes back for a long time. I, I, I think it's easy to coach a uh, A player. It's challenging to coach a B level player. However, you got to learn your, your craft. Coaching to me is about uh, proving that you care every day and learning each individual's uh, way to communicate. So I, I say you could either um, tease them with sugar or you have to take the whip to them. There's a time and place for everything. Uh, the game hasn't changed. The game is the same. The, the resources are far more available. It's important that the players are comfortable with their environment so that they will be uh, comfortable in an uncomfortable setting. So whether you're playing good competition or it's big moments in a game or championship games, it, it's learning how to regulate and monitor your emotions, which, which allows you to play. It allows the creativity in your mind to execute. I think that other than blue chip players, that most players are equal in ability to move players around in a, in, in a football setting or, or uh, strong, stringent uh, systems. I, I refer to staying on the black squares of checker. I, I want players that understand that our, our systems is to, to leverage insurance behind mistakes. You have to be free to play. It doesn't mean you're loose. It doesn't mean we're the, the Russian five or the fab five Michigan basketball. It, it, it is uh you got to play for one another. It's a, it's a bond and a trust. It's an everyday occurrence, not only from coach to players or players to coach, and then amongst themselves in a dress room. Uh, the word culture comes across a lot, um, but everybody can use those coin phrases. There, there's a difference between being a, a participant and being a winner, and uh, not everybody can be a winner, um, but it, it's that being comfortable when you're uncomfortable is – kind of the setting or the adversity that I apply in practice. I, I love Monday to Thursday. Uh, the games are pretty much uh, the players have to not only prove um, the retention, but also application and the lessons.